welcome to episode 416 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with... Ash Baker. Michael O'Malley. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about movies that we saw this week in part one. And then in part two, we're going to be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movies series with um, 1972's Pink Flamingos. So uh, if kids are in the car right now, maybe... Maybe pause that part two for later, because it's going to get, you know, it's going to get raunchy. <laughs> it's as, as divine intended. Um, real quickly, head over to uh, cinematary.com. If you have not caught up with the series or you're just kind of floating in because you want to hear us talk about John Waters, which is fair. Um, head over. We got the whole front half of our series. I mean, after this, we have three more movies left, so... Uh, bunch more uh, in the old archives if you would like to catch up on young critics watch old movies uh, i was looking the other day and our bicycle thieves episode that andrew and i did is, is starting to pick up some some interest so uh good to see good to see the the the, the young people are interested in italian neorealist films <laughs> mozzarella sandwiches you know, poverty government dysfunction who doesn't love a mozzarella what's, what's sandwich what's not to relate to um all right, well, let's go ahead and jump into uh, into movies we saw this week in part one, and uh, I think I got Michael you down for the first one. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about this movie from 1994 called Fella Day. Fella Day. I, I think I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, anyway, this, the name is the like animal family that the cat, like house cats, come from um, in terms of like taxonomy um but uh it's a german animated film from 1994 and it is wild it um it's it's basically like a mystery story so this cat gets uh his he and his owner moved to this new neighborhood and so this cat like spends time like looking around the neighborhood and he finds like that it's just this incredibly hard-boiled grizzly place you know like within five minutes of arriving he just sees this other cat with its throat clawed out and just like dead on the in the yard and so he befriends all these other like neighborhood cats and there's this whole like secret society of cats that are doing experiments on other cats for mystical weird reasons um and the whole thing becomes like I saw someone compare it to um, Kiss Me Deadly, and I think that that's a pretty apt comparison, only if Kiss Me Deadly were starring cats and animated and kind of looked like maybe uh, Oliver and Company, except with R-rated violence as the cats get disemboweled and stuff. Um, Yeah, I'm I'm looking at images right now, and there is a decapitated cat. Yeah, so, uh, I'm not watching that shit. Yeah, I don't know about it's, that. I'm not watching it's that. It's pretty <laughs> grisly, um, but it's also pretty cool. Not the fact that cats died, but it's cool because it's like a really hard-boiled neo-noir just completely filtered through what appears to be a family animated film, although it's obviously not like geared for families, but it's kind of in the vein of um, Watership Down or something like that, where you have... Um, kind of an exterior that is cute on some level that um, has ends up, ends up being like this really bizarre, mystical and violent tale about um, like dark forces and like uh, co-centric rings of power within this neighborhood where um, people are like these cats are just manipulating each other into doing awful things to each other um, I'm probably not selling this very well, and it's probably a hard sell regardless. I, I looked at the pup photos, and I'm yeah. out, so I can't watch that. I have two cats in the house. I can't be, like, showing them this content. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly not for everyone. <laughs> I, why would I watch this when I could just watch Fifle Goes West again? That's true. That's true. Um, Fifle does almost get eaten in that. I remember being young and being kind of traumatized when Fifle almost gets eaten by the cat. Um, but anyway, if the thing that I've described to you doesn't sound off-putting, it's a kind of interesting example of adult animation that doesn't often get, like a lot of times adult animation is kind of, 
edgy and funny and, you know, like whatever, like, like the Simpsons or Ralph Bakshi, like something like that. Uh, and this is an example of something that feels like adult animation in the sense of we're trying to make a movie that uh, might be geared toward adults if it were not animated. And so we're going to try to make an animated version of that using the tropes of animation, like like animals and stuff, um, which I think I think is interesting. And I thought it was an interesting movie. It's not like an awesome, like amazing movie. It's like 80 minutes and it goes way too fast. Like it's the sort of story that it doesn't feel like it has as much gravity as it could because it's just like beat after beat after beat, you know, until finally you're meeting like Cat Hitler. Um, and it maybe uh, should have spent a little bit more time, you know, drawing out that. But it's um, it's an incredibly moody and uh, interesting, like, piece of animation, too. Because, like I said, like, the it kind of looks like Oliver and Company, and it's maybe, like, that caliber of animation where it's kind of, like, rough around the edges, but ultimately is pretty smooth and... Um, as- does it also have Billy Joel music? You no, know, it doesn't. It does have like there's like a singer songwriter ballad that plays over the opening and closing credits, which is not Billy Joel, but um, is maybe like kind of like the Once Upon a Time in New York City place setting. Um, but uh, for like a I, I, German animation, there's really not a lot of it, and so it's kind of funny that this movie exists at all, but also that this movie exists and looks like fairly comparable to what Disney was doing, not in the nineties when this movie came out, but maybe in like the eighties before they started using computer assisted technology. Um, yeah. So there's an English dub, which I watched, uh, but there, you can also watch it in German. Wait, it's German. Well, so the Germans made a movie with a cat Hitler. Yeah. It's, I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's a reckoning of, uh, the Holocaust or something. I don't know. It's oh, mostly just grim. It. Mostly just grim. Um, I mean, it's not like 100% Cat Hitler, but he's like, you know, torturing other cats for like bizarre mystical and like reasons surrounding like supremacy and domination. I mean, it's maybe baked in there somewhere. Um, anyway, seems like a like a tough crowd for this movie, but... I got something out of it. <laughs> Do y'all not have any cats at the house? No, we used to. Well, now, now we know what happened to him. Yeah, I know. Cat, cat Hitler <laughs> got him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, if you want to watch uh, Fella Day, it's on um, YouTube. You can. It's on YouTube. But uh, you if you're a cat you owner, want. maybe uh, maybe watch it somewhere else, if at all. You know, I will say uh, the movie that we're about to discuss in part two involves an actual live animal being like brutally murdered on screen. So, you know, this is just not a great episode for animal lovers. Yeah, yeah. Pete is going to come after us for this one. Um, eh, whatever. All right. I want to toss it over to Ash to get us on something that I'm sure is uh, much less animal murdery. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, there's a human murder, but that's Whatever. not as bad. Um, so I watched um, Rainer Fassbender's last movie, uh, Corel, or Corel, or however you say it in French. Um, but basically, it's based on this um, French novel that came out in the late 40s, and um, about gay sailors and so basically the sailors come to town in Brest, France and um, they go to this place where they like play poker and like get picked up and stuff and um, anyway I thought it was a beautiful story even though like some of the like the it, it was just kind of like jarring sometimes like the plot jumps but like it was a really beautiful story and um i really like all of the like aesthetics it feels like it's well it's definitely like on 
a built set where they filmed it, um, it seems like. And uh, you've got this lighting that's like sort of not pretending not to be theater. And um, it's just kind of pretty and... Uh, the outfits are like really ridiculous, but they, um, like they never once blink and like wink at the camera and say, my outfit's ridiculous, right? It like leans into the narrative and it's like, yes, like this is completely sincere. And, um, I really liked it, uh. I've only seen... Where does it stand on uh, animal cruelty? Where does it stand on animal cruelty? I don't think there's a single animal in the movie. Yeah. That's pretty cruel, so I would say. Yeah. To it also. Um, was this the first Fassbender movie you'd ever seen? No, I've seen um, Ollie Fear Eats the Soul um, a few years ago, but this was the second. Yeah. Uh, I have not seen any of his work, um, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of curious. I put Fox and his friends on uh, on the young critics ballot, but I feel like it's a, like Fassbender is a famous director that we have never really touched at all. Yeah, he's a really interesting character. Fassbender. Fassbender. I was going to ask what was the movie that people chose instead of Fox and His Friends. This one. <laughs> no, wait, no. Fassbender is not English, no, though, I know. right? Okay. No, it, it's, the, it's next week's movie in the Realm of the Senses instead. Oh, okay. They were like, let's watch, some, let's watch some horny Japanese people instead of watch whatever Fassbender's got going on. I got to say, we have a wild, like, 70s pick layout. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah. if you kind of like, if you take away a little bit of like last week's uh, Soy Cuba and go from like Faster Pussycat to Pink Flamingos and In the Realm of the like it's a real, it's a real trip. Ash, how did you feel like this compared to the uh, Ali Furious the Soul? Um, I was honestly sort of surprised when I looked up because I didn't know like where in it in his filmography that it landed. Um, when I first watched it. And so I looked it up and I was surprised that it was his last film because Ollie Fear Eats the Soul feels very like um, contemporary in many ways. Like just the way that it's shot and um, like the style and the, you know, uh, but obviously like um I wasn't alive when this movie came out and I wasn't alive when the book it was based on came out, which, you know, he really like leaned heavy into the outfits of the time that the book would have come out and it's excellent. But, um, I wasn't alive at either of those times. So I like have no idea, um, basically, uh, like how it would feel to like, live in the 80s or (laughs) in um the 40s so um yeah i i really appreciated it but i just like i think it makes me want to watch more of his movies because it just shows me like oh like he made this really great movie ollie furies the soul and then like i watched this and it's like Like, it just, I feel like a lot of people will probably watch it and think, like, this is hilarious, but I think it's, like, really cool, because I think it's, like, very sincere, actually. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. No, I, I, I th- I'm, like I said, I'm curious to get some fast bender on the lineup to kind of engage with him. That would be kind of cool. No. Nice. Well, from gay sailors to Comanche Indians or Comanche Native American members in the early 1700s fighting predator. That's a nice transition. (laughs) 
It's a seamless transition. Um, Prey is the latest uh, in the Predator franchise. I'll be honest, not a big Predator person. I was just uh, like, you have this Comanche warrior and the Great Plains and 1719 fighting Predator. That seemed pretty fun to me. And it pays off on that level of just like, like she's got like this tomahawk thing going on that like she has it like connected to her and she like throws it and can bring it back and all this stuff. She's, this is a nice animal movie. She's got a great dog. Um, great dog in the movie. Um, but this is directed by Dan Trachtenberg who did 10 Cloverfield Lane. Um, and I guess also did some Black Mirror episodes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, pretty much you, you catch up with Naru who's played by Amber Midthunder. Um, who is an indigenous actress uh, and she is the skilled Comanche warrior but she's not like ma- she's mainly kind of doing uh, some hunting and, uh, and such but she's not like part of the, like the hunting party and, and the people who are making decisions um, and so I guess part of the tr- of their tradition is that um, they have to have like a, they kind of have to lead this this big hunt and bring back the, the kill and that kind of establishes them into that rank. Um, and so she picks <laughs> the predator um, to be her yeah, unknowingly. Um, but it definitely plays with just the whole idea of you have predator with like his little, uh, with just all of his like advanced technologies taking on this native American warrior. And um, on that level, it's pre- again, it's pretty fun. It's, it's a pretty, it's, it's like, little over 90 minutes uh, it moves very very uh it's well paced i mean i really liked dan trachtenberg at least he's two for two on let me just do a random sequel to a six to a, you know either a successful franchise or a successful property that nobody asked for and we'll see how it goes and either, both of them have been pretty solid like they like they're not uh they're not blowing the world up but they're just like yeah this is like a nice little genre picture that's like very tightly scripted has great action and like i had a good time for the you know 90 or so minutes that i was watching this and same with in cloverfield lane um it has this um it does really like the 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 last uh sequence when the, the, or actually i take that back it has this one sequence so she, she runs into these um can, uh, these French Canadian uh, fur trappers at one point, and they capture her and her brother, and then are like, you know, we are going to get the predator, and you're like, oh, okay, French Canadian fur trappers, and so they like use them as they use the two, they use uh, Naru and her brother as the bait, um, but as they as they learn, like predators, just like if you're just sitting there, I'm not gonna bug you, but if you got like a weapon it's over and so there's like you know they're like there in the middle of this giant field with all the the fur trappers all set up around it and the sequence is just the predator just like blowing through all these these just fur trappers um and it's pretty great because they're like they establish themselves as assholes ahead of it so you get to just watch him like mow through them for an entire sequence um and then the last the last sequence when she's uh kind of trapping him finally um is pretty great uh it does have i saw people pointed out on letterbox it does have like the cgi animals similar not to the level of rrr but like um but kind of similar to that uh, but I think there, it, it's you know, it's fine. There's a great, there's a great shot where like the predator like lifts up this bear that he's like, this is not a at the same time not an animal friendly movie, but it's CGI. So he like lifts up this grizzly bear and like cuts open its stomach, and then like all this like blood comes on it, and then so you can't see the predator because he's got this little like cloaking device thing, but then it's just like all this red on him to like outline him. That's just like yeah, that's a crazy ass shot. I like it. Um, but if you're looking for like a nice 90 plus minute tight action movie that uh, is not super serious, check out Prey. It's on Hulu. Um, Amber Mid Thunder, the the main actress, is great, um, and a lot of a lot of tomahawk bow and arrow fighting along with 
I don't know. I don't know the predator lore and all his little weapons and stuff, but uh, he's definitely got a little little uh, little thing for himself. So that's that. But more more importantly, I want to talk about a baller ass movie. That's Blue Collar, which is now on uh, Criterion Channel. Uh, this came out in '78. It's uh, Paul Schrader's first directed movie. Um, it stars Richard Pryor, Harvey Keitel, and Yafik Kodo. Um, they have a Criterion Channel right now has a has like a, a series of Yafik Kodo um, movies, which is uh, which is why this one's on there. But it's one that I actually like flagged a number of years ago to watch. Um, but pretty much the movie is uh, Richard Pryor, Harvey Keitel, and Yafik Kodo are these three. Um, line workers at uh i don't think they specify what the company is but an auto plant in detroit in the 70s um and at, when you when you kind of catch up with them they're getting pissed off at um the mistreatment that they're getting handed to them by uh like the plant management and the foreman and people like that but then they also have um their local union that's also kind of screwing them over their union reps not it uh, fulfilling any of the requests that um like especially uh richard pryor's character is is asking for and his literally is just like hey my locker's like messed up, messed up it's been messed up for like six months can i get it fixed um and he gets kind of like this whole well we gotta pick the we gotta pick our fights type th- situation and he's just like dude i just need my locker fixed um and so they decide to, um, because of all this, and you know, you, you kind of get these scenes where their debts are being raised and they're having to uh, figure out ends meet. Um, they decide uh, to go and rob the union headquarters because at one point Richard Pryor is there and he sees in the safe there and it's like they got a bunch of money and such there that you know they don't need because they're not doing anything. So we should go steal it. Um, and when they go and steal it, uh, they find like, I forgot what it was. It was like 400 bucks or 600 bucks or something. And, but the, the main takeaway that they have is they get this, like, um, this binder of different, uh, interest, interest loans and things like that, that are kind of not adding up that they can, that they can tell the, the, the union, uh, head is, is kind of fudging numbers in order to make money and so um this kind of leads them on their path because then like you know the police are getting involved the feds are getting involved the union's getting involved and it's all kind of all falling on 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 these three guys but i thought it was awesome it's a great movie i saw somebody describe it as like the kind of last breath of new hollywood um because it's just like this lean this lean thriller um with just three like all every performance is fantastic um i guess richard pryor and paul schrader did not get along at all on set yeah like they didn't like it was not it was not great at all and so but i mean he's fantastic in this movie um harvey keitel is is really great and then yafit koto is just kind of like the buddy the you know the, the guy in the middle who like they, the two of them have like Wife's and, wife and kids and families and Yafik Koto is like just this like player who's just like yeah I'm just having a good time um but yeah just I think it's a it's a lot smarter movie um than probably it's giving credit for I think it's really it's this really sharp commentary on just how on just the the American on just you know working in America and constantly trying to like crawl out of holes that um you know not you're not necessarily digging for yourself but is digging by being dug by others around you and the people who are employing you um and i think that the way the like the direction that it goes um and it's like third act is very it's kind of fascinating and 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 really has like this it reminds you of just kind of the at the end of the day everybody's just kind of trying to do do what they got to do to kind of keep themselves and especially if you're like a family involved like keep your family afloat um michael i know you've seen this movie do you have any anything on on blue collar um it has like one of the most memorable endings of a movie i've ever seen it's like one of those movies where it's 
a fairly linear movie and with each like successive beat that the movie takes you just get this like bigger and bigger pit in your stomach until like finally the end is just the biggest like just bummer of all um it's and... it's a really i mean not to spoil too much but like pretty much the 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 kind of friendship between richard pryor's character and harvey Keitel's character deteriorates and there's just like this really it's hard to watch and it's really sad because you've seen these guys be friends this entire movie and then there's this exchange where harvey Keitel's character calls him the n-word and like they have this kind of back and forth and it's just kind of it it's really challenging to watch because you're just like oh these guys were like you know, like the two families were bowling not 45 minutes ago you know yeah yeah I, but I mean like it's kind of wild because I think like there's like a Paul Schrader like trademark kind of movie and this is so far from that in a lot of ways and I think like a lot of his early career is really interesting because you know he's not quite like settled into every other movie is going to be a pickpocket riff thing yet and uh i think this stage of his career is just like really interesting in that regard like a few years later he made cat people for some reason and then there was this which is like just such a it's like probably his tightest screenplay just in terms of like you know structure and how it goes and i i think it's really great um it has this very like yeah. per- it has this percussion to it um you know you, you're introduced to it at the very beginning of the um of the movie but hardworking man is kind of like this undercurrent of of them while they're at the plant and so you have hardworking man playing through the titles and then it will have like this pause where it'll introduce like actors or directors or whatever that just kind of has like this this rhythm to it and then throughout the rest of the movie whenever they're in like the 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 auto plant working it just kind of has like you're usually hard working man's like playing in the background and it just has like this percussion to it so like you just kind of get sucked into the monotony of like metal clanging and people tightening like uh uh car parts and things like that that just there's just such, such this you get sucked into that monotony as you're watching it because you have those scenes where they're interacting there but you just kind of feel this like rhythm beat that's uh kind of permeating under it yeah there's a really like amazing sense of place too with that with that factory just like on the line um and like to the point where it's like uh it becomes menacing in and of itself right like there's a character who's murdered in the uh in the factory and it's like done through the instruments of the factory itself and it's just really that's a really brutal. scary scene like I, it, yeah. like it's not like um you know we'll talk about like horror movie it's not horror movie scary it's just the the person is in the room where they paint the car and so they have like a you know mask on and stuff like that but then they lock him him in and so they can't get out and you're just like you, there's not any music all you hear is like the paint brushes like spraying and going back and forth and you can just feel them choking to death and it's just it's yeah, it's, just, it's really it's really so disturbing brutal. yeah but also like it's a scene that would only have that kind of power if uh the movie had done what it had done with like establishing the setting um and just the really terrific sensory details that it has in there um it was interesting i was reading um paul schrader at the time i guess he was doing a a talk in france and they were asking him how like when he decided to make this a like make a political movie kind of like this and he was like i wasn't trying to make a political movie i was just making a movie like i was just making a movie about you know auto plant workers and, i've seen that quote before and that seems like such nonsense to right? me there's no way you can make this movie and not think it's political it's a super <laughs> political movie and it kind of um you know it's but it's not like it's not like overflowing with necessarily like deep leftist politics it's more just like like i said at the top it's more just kind of people going i just gotta like pay my bills and like feed my family and i don't want to get i want to get as less screwed over as possible um and so to to me it kind of like plays on this very like human level of it's not let's less a right and left thing and more just like a yeah these these guys are just trying to survive 
and bring food home and literally everybody around them is just trying to screw them over. I mean, I th- both I think the Richard Pryor character, I think all of actually all the characters have like at least two jobs. Um they don't see I can I don't feel like how they I don't see how they get any sleep. <laughs> there's not like, like they're constantly well at the same time though there's the one scene where Harvey Keitel goes and works at the factory, then goes and works at this gas station, then sleeps for like 3 hours and then goes out and does cocaine and hang out with hookers with uh, the other ones. So like at the same time like prioritize your sleep maybe instead of going and hanging out with the at the cocaine party. But um but yeah, no. I if you have Criterion Channel or you can get access to this, I I say check it out. I think it's a really, a really smart, um, just like you said, like a real like a tight script, just a really smart movie um, that I think is is that you know as relevant today as it probably was in '78. And I feel like as Paul Schrader kind of gets more like, hey, let's talk about Paul Schrader with like First Reformed and Card Counter and things like that. Hopefully, people who like that stuff will check out this one yeah i do think that i had seen like before his kind of resurgence in recent years i had seen like taxi driver and like his scorsese um you know um his scorsese collaborations and i was surprised going back to his older movies how engaging they are and like I said, not all of them are nearly so like, I mean, I like Paul Schrader, but a lot of his stuff is by design, very navel gazy, you know, like lonely man sitting at night writing in a journal kind of like, thing. yeah, and this is the complete and, opposite of that. Right. And he's got a lot of movies that are kind of the opposite of that early on. And I think it's really interesting that, I mean, he eventually found his like transcendental style, like thing that he really burrowed into, but I do think that it is fascinating to see like this early version of him who was like trying on all these different genres. It's funny you mentioned his transcendental style. Um, friend of the pod, Darren Hughes, posted a. I think he watched this recently as well and posted a screenshot of one part where you have like the Ford, um, the Ford like steam stack and all the like metal uh, metal uh, buildings and wires kind of connecting everything. And it remind and he's like I, I clearly like. Paul Schrader was probably thinking a little bit about Ozu in this because especially in like his late period movies, Ozu gets like fascinated with like the industrial uh, like uh, surge in Japan and like has all of these like metal buildings and like buildings that protruding behind like homes and things like that. And so it felt very like in line with, with that, it reminds me a little bit also of something like um, True Stories by David Byrne, um, just in terms of like capturing, uh, capturing like just, you know, Rust Belt fly over America in like this beautiful way. So, Blue Collar, Aces, check it out. Uh, but we're going to take a quick break and then we will be back and we're going to be talking about John Waters, Divine, and some Pink Flamingos after this. Part two of episode 416 of Cinematary. In this part, we're going to be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movie series with 1972's Pink Flamingos. Written and directed by John Waters, the film stars Divine, David Lockery, Mink Stoll, Danny Mills, and Mary Vivian Pierce. 
A bizarre woman and her misfit family compete with a Baltimore couple to be named the filthiest people alive. That's, the, that's all you need to know about the plot. Uh, a title card appears in the opening credits with the following dedication for Sadie, Katie, and Les, February 1972. The, new, the names refer to Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten, three disciples of Charlie Manson. Uh, Waters later referred to the dedication in his book Role Models, uh, apologizing for the reference, was, which was a sarcastic nod to the cult leader's Manson family and the murders they committed. Uh, Alan Lee Optical also receives a special thanks in the opening credits. Um, the budget for Pink Flamingos was reported as 10000 in uh, an April 1997 issue of The Advocate and Village Voice. However, in 19, April 1997 issue of Detour magazine, as well as The Hollywood Reporter Review, claimed it cost 12000 According to a April 1997 news brief, in People, uh, Waters' parents, Patricia and John Sr., provided the, fun, uh, the financing. Um, what a supportive mom and dad to give their child funding to make this movie. Oh, they're coming! They're coming back with their uh, with their review later on. So we'll get back to Patricia and John Cena. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, filming took place in Baltimore in 1972 over the course of five months. Waters edited his original quote sound stripped 16 millimeter film footage to create the final version, which was nicely aged by the process. A sound delay accompanied each accompanied each edit in the early prints due to Waters' rudimentary technique in the look and style of the director's low-budget filmmaking came to be known as the Baltimore Aesthetic, a term allegedly coined by Providence, Rhode Island art students. Divine's friend Bob Adams described the trailer where they lived as uh, the trailer set for the movie as a hippie commune in Phoenix, Maryland, and noted that their living quarters were in a farmhouse without hot water. Adams added that ultimately Divine and Van Smith decided to sleep at Susan Lowe's home in Baltimore, and that they would awake before dawn to apply Divine's makeup before being driven to the set by Jack Walsh. Quote, sometimes Divi would have to wait out in full drag for Jack to pull the car around from back, and cars full of these blue-collar types on their way to work would practically mount the pavement from gawking at him. Uh, the final scene of the film would provide particularly infamous was would prove particularly infamous involving the character of Babs eating fresh dog. This is feces eating fresh dog shit. Um, as Divine later told a reporter, "quote I followed that dog around for three hours, just zooming in on its asshole, waiting for it to empty its bowels so that they would film the scene." In an interview, <laughs> in, in an interview not in character, Harris Milstead revealed that he soon called uh, an emergency room nurse, pretending that his child had eaten dog uh, dog shit, to inquire about possible harmful effects, which there are none. Um, Divine. Ben? There are none. Surely not none. <laughs> well, you know. Uh, Divine asked his mother, Frances Milstead, not to watch the film. I wish that she obliged. Several several years before his death, though, uh, Francis asked him if he had really eaten dog shit in the film, to which he said, quote, just, uh, to which he, quote, just looked at me with that twinkle in his blue eyes, laughed, and said, Mom, you wouldn't believe what they can do nowadays with trick photography. Uh, screenings may have taken place as early as 1972, but sources cited the February 1973 opening at the New York, at New York City's Elgin Theater as the film's theatrical debut. Uh, according to an article by director Gus Van Sant, Pink Flamingos ran as a midnight movie for 95 weeks in New York City and for 10 consecutive years in L.A. Jay Hoberman stated that Waters' controversial picture, quote, enjoyed the most sustained midnight popularity of any movie until David Lynch's eraser, Eraserhead. Um, and the film took in more than $5 million in box office receipts by 1980. Uh, the film was initially banned in Switzerland and Australia, as well as in some provinces in Canada and Norway. The film was eventually released uncut in, on VHS in Australia in 1984 with an X rating, but... <clears throat> But distribution of the video has since been discontinued. The 1997 version was cut by the distributor to achieve an R18 plus rating after it was. It also refused classification. Um, no submissions of the film have been made since, but it has been said that one of the reasons for which it was banned as a film showing actual sexual activity cannot be rated X in Australia if it also features violence. So the highest a film such as Pink Flamingos could be rated as R18+, plus would now not apply given that the depiction of actual sex was passed within the R18+, plus rating for romance in 1999, two years following Pink Flamingos re-release. 
Water's own parents, uh, also the film's financiers, never saw Pink Flamingos. In, a 19, in an April 1997 brief in People, Patricia was quoted as saying, quote, We are very proud of John, but we just don't see any point in subjecting ourselves to that film. <laughs> <laughs> in his uh, LA Times 1974 review, Kevin Thomas stated that the film was, quote, as funny as it is outrageous, but warned that Pink Flamingos was, quote, for the very open minded. In their 1974 review, Variety called it, quote, surely one of the most vile, stupid, and repulsive films ever made. And during the re release in 1997, Roger Ebert said, John Waters' Pink Flamingos has been restored for its 25th anniversary revival. And with any luck at all, that means I won't have to see it again for another 25 years. If I haven't retired by then, I will. So, on that note, let's talk a little bit about Pink Flamingos. Um, Ash, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you because I know that you're a big fan of, uh, of this movie and John Waters. So what about this one uh, just gets you going? Well, I think that you've sort of just given me like evidence to, you know, like just keep believing my belief. Because like, you know, those reviews you just read, it's like Gus Van Zandt thinks it's beautiful but Robert e- Roger Ebert fucking hates it. Well, Roger Ebert is a fuckhead. What did he ever do? You know? It's like, Gus Van Zandt's an artist, you know? And it's like, I don't know. So, I think John Waters, as a filmmaker, and just, like, appreciating his, like, sort of rise as, um, uh, like, rise in status and, like, the film community uh, is just really interesting to me. And I think that like really at the heart of that is he just had something that he wanted to do and he did it in a different way, every movie, but he still did that thing. And that thing was be utterly vile. And eventually people are like, you know, he's really sticking to the bit, you know, like, he's sincere about this and you start to look at his movies in a different way. I think once you realize like he might be being sincere, you know, (laughs) they're kind of sweet. Like there's something sweet about his movies. Yeah. Family values. He said this movie was about family (laughs) values. Well, like the, the thing is, even though the characters might be, you know, these reviewers go oh well these are vile like repugnant characters like he does have you know this is very much a staple throughout most of his movies especially his early ones but like he still loves them like he's just like yeah i love these these gross weirdos like who cares like they're like they they're doing their thing they're locked you know they're they're doing i mean like the scene and this is honestly probably had the most like um for me out of the whole movie had the biggest gross out was that he has like the party i think it's is it Divine's birthday or is it the the mop? Yeah, so it's oh, the, with the pig head. Yeah, and so and so they have like the well, they have the pig head, but also you have the guy who's like who like leans up and is just like puckering his asshole, and I was just like Jesus. Well, surfing bird plays. <laughs> yeah, it really ruined the you know Family Guy has nothing on on John Waters with the puckering asshole, um, but like you know like yeah, it's like this. It's just this like just gross repugnant scene but it's also like everybody's like they all like each other they all, like they have their community like they're having a good time they're, it's like te- they're really not they're hurting anybody like, Haha, can- look at his asshole go well they're not like the like the mink stole and david lockery characters <laughs> are actually hurting people divine doesn't seem to be like hurting anybody at least you don't see anything it's just like they're just kind of out there and they're doing their thing by themselves there's well there's something like she does you- kill people there's something weirdly utopian about it like it's like a truly uh like inclusive community and the thing that is so evil about the other couple um is that they're they're posers right they're like bourgeois people who want to be vile right but they're not really like by definition they're not like part of this utopian project because they want to like bring bring other people down um, whereas like in the scenes with, uh, divine and that whole family, 
it's just like you know what the Eggman comes to to visit and we're just gonna like have a chat with the Eggman <laughs> or you know uh... <laughs> I love eggs I was laughing at that scene because I'm like you gotta you can't tell me there's not like people in Brooklyn who actually have somebody like that to bring like eggs that they can pick out at their house but you know it seems like a hipstery thing to do, but I'm like, yeah, here it's just like, no, Edith likes her eggs, and she gets all of she them. She loves eggs. She's super into eggs. I also love, sh- she entertains me in female trouble as well, but yeah. Edith Massey is super fun. Just like, she, she spends the whole movie, for the most part, just in the crib thing, and then marries the egg man. <laughs> and, and they live happily ever they after. They live happily it's, ever after. It's very sweet. Yeah. Um, so how uh ash how many i guess uh, this is this is probably your favorite john waters i mean how how does this kind of rank or or come up against other ones of his that you've seen well my favorite one to watch just like in general is probably polyester um just because it's like i'm not gonna sit down to just like have a laugh and a feel-good movie and put on pink flamingos you know like I don't, I don't know anyone like that, but it's like, it's, it's a kind of movie, like when you do see it, you know, it's like, you know, this movie, it, it's funny. And that's like part of the like chaos of John Waters is like, you know, you could make a version of this movie where it was horrifying, you know, if you changed the tone of the movie, you know, but like if you just flip the switch and nothing was funny anymore, like this would be a completely different narrative, I think. Um, but like, because everything is like funny and like theatrical and, um, yeah, I I think it, um, sort of lends itself to being like a little uncomfortable because it's like, Oh, you know, like, this it is horrifying, but like also it's kind of funny. Um, but uh, so that's like, well, it's constantly kind of like bouncing, like bouncing like around the line and then like crossing the line and bouncing. But like, it's just cause like you'll have scenes where like, yeah, she's talking to the egg man, but I think that's after, uh, cracker the one guy has sex with the woman with the chickens involved uh, that yeah and you're just like like that that scene is the too much scene yeah that for one's me, that but... that one's a lot but then you go to edith talking to the Eggman and like love it and then you know you go from like the scene i love the beginning of the scene when he and divine go to the 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 couple's house and are just like spitting on everything because I'm just like, why are they just why are they just spitting on everything? But then it leads into the the very infamous fellatio scene. You're just like, whoa! <laughs> and then uh, then they also go down to like stop the child, well not child labor, but the 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 two chained up women who are having babies that they can sell to lesbians, as they say. <laughs> I like they. The, but that's also like the it, the act itself is not funny but when they're describing it it's kind of funny because there's like yeah we have we we have babies and we sell it to lesbians <laughs> like it's just matter of fact like that's their business yeah it's it's like it's like the political structure of like the underworld <laughs> but it definitely just kind of bounces between the lines at a, at a lot of the time and you're just like what the fuck's going on <laughs> I think, like, the one thing that's the through line for me in a lot of, especially the early John Waters movies, where it just, it, like, they truly have the feel of, like, just folks hanging out and just doing, you know, weird, weird shit. But there is something just, like, even, like, when there's just absolutely detestable things going on on the screen, there's, like, a sense of camaraderie among the performers that I think is really electric in, in these early movies. Um, and it, I mean, I have no idea like what sort of like what John Waters world looked like when the camera wasn't on, but like it captures the sense of like a, a world, this kind of like bizarre world that is completely unencumbered from like any sort of, 
uh, responsibility toward uh, tradition or convention and like in some ways it's kind of horrifying but in the sense of like these people are all together all like contributing like 200% to this like ben- completely bananas project like there's something just really um, special about that that is like so like I've, I've, you know, you can watch low budget movies and you can tell like they're uh, most low budget movies that are like, you know, just thread, you know, shoestring productions. Like you can kind of, you can tell the ways in which like things just don't land and there's no on screen, on screen chemistry or anything like that. But there's, there's something about just the energy, like the communal energy of these movies. And especially I think this one, which is maybe the most like ensemble energetic one of his early ones uh that i've seen and i don't know it's just like there there's like the level of the plot that you're watching so that's like kind of wild and engaging on some level but then there's also just like the idea of this movie being made and because it's so low budget and because there's no so little pretense uh or or like quote unquote sophistication to the film style like it feels a lot closer to um like a document of that scene than you might get with the slicker production. And I love that feel to this movie. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think while watching this, I was thinking female troubles, a lot more structured and has a, just a stronger like through line that it's following this one, like uh, this one, I like there were parts that I enjoyed, but like I was saying, um, uh, before we we started this part, like anytime Divine is not on the screen, it's a little less entertaining because Divine is just such a like presence, um, and the other pe- the other folks just get a lot of screen time, and I'm kind of just like, no, when's when when's Divine coming back and doing stuff? Um, and so, and I, I feel like there's just even though there's crazy shit happening, there's like ironically there's like lulls in it to me where it's just kind of. You know, the couple are doing like you have the scenes where like the couple are following um, uh, the David Lockery characters, like showing his dick to these two teen girls. And then you have the one where um, where he like shows his dick and then it's a trans woman and she like shows her dick and then he like sprints off like completely afraid. Um, and so like you kind of have that stuff and it's just like these like kind of in between moments that are fine but also i don't know it's not i'm i was i'm much more engaged while watching like female trouble than i am watching when i was watching this one just because i think there's a little bit more going on and i think that the side characters at least have um a little bit more definition even though i do agree with you michael that just kind of the randomness and like the 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 very home video feeling of this is is kind of its strong suit I think I want to talk about the music a little bit because I love the music and um, a lot of it is like doo-wop and kind of like early 60s like pop hits and like those sort of records and I think that is so key to like the atmosphere of this movie um, is that contrast and it kind of like in a weird way and a not... Uh, reminds me of like what David Lynch would go on to do especially in like the 80s where he like kind of contrasts this kind of like old school like Americana like post-war vibe with like these really uh, squirmy gross stuff Um, and in this movie that's going on as well except that like it's squirmy and gross and kind of endearing Um, but I really like the music and there's some like sequences that are just great. Like, um, isn't it, isn't divine like shoplifting meat and it's like the girl can't help it or something. And then of course there's surfing bird. And then there's, um, how much is that dog in the window is playing for the dog poop scene. Right. There's just so many great things in it. Like at first they kind of play as gags because of like the dissonance between the two, but usually these songs play for a long time, like several minutes at a time. And by the end of that, there's, there's like a weird synergy that goes on where it's not really ironic anymore. It's kind of like what you were saying, Ash, where after a while it's so committed to the bit that it kind of wraps around to, this is kind of weirdly endearing and sincere. Um, and I don't know, the, the, that's kind of a weird thing and interesting thing for ironic needle drops to kind of cease to be ironic 
because you let them play out for so long. I don't know. I, I was I was reading um, while looking up notes that I guess in the original cut that uh, there's the Rite of Spring at, at some point. I don't think it's in, it's not in the 97 re-release, but they use the Rite of Spring at some point in, in the 97 re Like the like the modern classical yeah, piece? Yeah, and, uh, and like <laughs> whenever the 97 re and like John Waters was having to get the rights to the music, they were just like, no, you can't use the Rite of Spring for this movie. <laughs> The sanctity, of Stravinsky. Who owns the right of spring? Who owns the rights to the right of spring? Oh, uh, whatever, whatever. I guess, um, whatever. Like maybe the Stravinsky estate. I don't know. But they were just like, Gosh, no. What a bunch of posers. <laughs> uh, but I can only imagine like that sequence. You mentioned uh, the uh, when Divine is shoplifting meat. I like that sequence because there's the guy who like comes over and I forgot if it's like a sausage or something he's not he didn't have his dick out but he like has a sausage and he's like waving it in front and like divine doesn't even really react divine just kind of looks at him and just like whatever and then like just like grabs the meat and just like walks out the door and he's just like he's like on the ground just like wagging the sausage at, like just it's like incredibly and that's that's pretty much a lot of the vibes of this movie it's just somebody doing something like that and you're like and they just kind of like walk around it um I also like you know, going back to kind of the whole thing about the community feel. Um, I like that how like insular this this feud for filthiest person alive is. It kind of it's it's like you know it's Divine's family against this couple that live in Baltimore, and it feels like a feud between like the five of them and maybe like four other people. <laughs> but somehow like it gets magazine yeah, coverage but it's, and media coverage but it's, it's, <laughs> Yeah, it feels like a it feels like a medieval feud to me where it's like, you know, um, how dare thee accuse me of being less filthy than you? I have reigned this kingdom for years. And so it's like and then we get like the fulfillment where he comes onto the property and divines like, no, and so that's my interpretation it's very of the Shakespearean movie. you know yeah. this is John Waters yeah. Shakespeare I do think it's yeah, funny it's... though like does it am I remembering right? like the feud starts when like the, the other couple like it's like a magazine or whatever on the cover it says divine filthiest person alive and they're just scandalized yeah it, it's just like divine <laughs> like <laughs> It's just like a, it's like a basic <laughs> yeah. photo of like, like, and it's like filthiest person alive. <laughs> uh, I love the escalating war too. Like when um they ma- they mail the the poop to <laughs> divine. Yeah, yeah. I was going to uh, mention that because I was just listening to a podcast recently, um, and they were talking about this is kind of old news now, but it was like these croquet players these like uh professional croquet players in the uk um like two of them it would be like i guess like if golfers here got i don't know i don't understand croquet but anyway these two professional croquet players got mailed a used piece of toilet paper in the mail like every month for like years (laughs) did they respond and and so that's like like Oh my so, god, someone sent me a bowel move. <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, it's like, um, because, like, basically one of them confessed on Twitter and was like, I've never told anybody this, but this has been happening for 10 years now. And, like, and like it really bothers me. <laughs> and, like, another, the other croquet player the like famous croquet player was like me too dude like it's been happening for six years (laughs) and and so that's what i think of when i like think of this like i cannot believe you know just like you know who did this this is the most outrageous i can't deal with it that's what i think of (laughs) there's also there's also such a like I mean, nobody's coming in here expecting like world class acting, but there's like this like very like charm to the um like unexperienced actor quality of all of this. Like I love somebody like I love listening to somebody like Edith Massey talk and you know, 
the, there's no like like theatrical training to it. It's just her just kind of like, and I want to see the Eggman. I like to have this egg, the brown egg and the white. You know, it's, it's just like this very matter of fact way. And, and other than, but it's so good. for the most part, everybody. Yeah, everybody everybody has it other than Divine I think still kind of has that um that that quality but at the same time he definitely does elevate it to a degree where like he, like the spin that's on it you can, is very satirical and um overblown. I love also uh the narration which I think is John Waters, right? Yeah, John which Waters, is just yeah. great because it has that kind of amateurist quality. Like you just like stuck a microphone up in someone's face and like put the script and they're just reading it. Um, but also uh, there's just this really like hammed up accent going on. And um, I, like, I, I don't know, like there's just something about it that I think is just really fun. Um, kind of broadly, I mean, how... I guess how how do you you all think John Waters plays for like like do you think you know eighteen twenty twenty five like that kind of range people kind of getting into movies and kind of seeking out stuff outside the normal realm like do you think John Waters still plays for for current audiences or is it kind of still very much outsider. I mean, he's become kind of an institution, right? I mean, he's in the Jackass movie. He's in Alvin and the Chipmunks. Um, he's in... I don't know, like, I knew who John Waters was before I had seen any of his movies. Like, he's kind of that kind of person. Um, and it, I don't know, that's kind of interesting to consider. Like, this person who is, like, the most outsider-ish of outsider art becoming a kind of institution unto himself. I... I don't know, like I maybe some people find that depressing because it's like corporatized or whatever, but there's something kinda cool about the the guy who made Pink Flamingos is now just like vibing. No, I love it. I'm I think it's I think it's incredible. And I think that it's like well deserved, I guess, too. Like um, but I, in preparation for this recording, I watched the Simpsons episode with John Waters, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, if you all haven't seen it, highly recommend. Um, he's, he's a character. I also watched him on, uh, Stephen Colbert in preparation. He's, he's just... He's a chill dude. He's he's very much like he's John Waters, you know. It's like he's hilarious. There's no, I I like yeah. There's no. I yeah, I love him. I cited him in my thesis. Like I think he's, I think he's a genius, and I want him to adopt me. At the same time, like I do remember, I watched some like the first John Waters movie I watched was Hairspray, which is not super representative of his stuff. But then I watched like Polyester, and I'd seen a couple other of his later films, and I remember going back and watching like some of his his early ones, like Pink Flamingos or um, Multiple Maniacs or whatever, which I only just recently watched. And there is something very distinct and shocking about these early ones that I don't think I was prepared for, knowing who he was. Like I had heard like, wow, Divine Eats Poop and um, all this sort of stuff, but I don't know. There, there is something kind of in these movies that is a bizarre fit with maybe the more cuddly image that he has now. Um, and like, I don't know, I've never shown this to someone who's 20. Uh, but me watching this for the first time, which I think was last year or two years ago, I remember thinking like, Oh wow, this is, this is another level of depth that I wasn't quite ready for. Like I was ready for like the camp and like the kind of amateurs qualities, but the like just a baldly transgressive, like really like hardcore punk rock kind of ethos, I think was shocking despite me being familiar with what his cultural legacy was. Um, and so, I mean, I've ended, I've ended up really liking a lot of this stuff, but I do wonder, like, even people who are familiar with, like, the kind of public persona of John Waters right now, um, you know, how would they feel going back to this? Like, I'd, I'd just be curious. 
Well, I asked the question mainly because, like, I think, especially, not that his um, films are explicitly, like, supposed to be queer movies, but I think that there is, like, that queerness um, encapsulated in them. And I just, I feel like it's a little bit different than the kind of representation that people are kind of seeking in queer movies, like, today, where there is just kind of this abrasiveness to these movies not because not because they were like truly struggling with their identity but more just it's more a product of the environment like that's what they're kind of they're doing these like they're being these vile repugnant like gregarious characters because they're they're you know john waters and divine all these people are are lashing out against um, the society they were growing up around, and I'm, I'm, just, I wonder if like, if like people today kind of going, oh, let's explore this, would connect with that or feel like, like, it almost is doing a disservice to have you know divine eating dog shit. I feel like, I don't know. There is, I think in rec- like of the last few years, there's been maybe like a reclamation of like that kind of like older more radical like outsider like counterculture status like the whole like be gay do crimes meme you know that sort of thing i think has become more in vogue than um it maybe would have been i don't know i can't i can't say because i have not watched this movie with the young queer audience so that's just my thought i i was the young queer audience i can speak to the young queer audience um i saw this and i was like fuck yeah we're eating cops tonight that is a great brother scene too. <laughs> it's my birthday party show me that butt yeah. <laughs> you know it's like, i don't know like i feel um like that camaraderie is something that i relate to not that like me or any of my friends have ever done anything so vile, you know, but it's like, you know, I, I, watching the, the documentary about divine or whatever. And, um, I forget who it was. It's been years since I've seen it, but, um, she was like, yeah, it was the seventies and we were, you know, the, we were the punks and we ate meat. And I was like, yeah, like they didn't really subscribe to like, I think like the early essence of punk rock is not really subscribing to any sort of brand or label. And so when you grow up queer in a place like John Waters grew up or like, you know, here you know it's like you don't you don't have the language to put a label on anything and so it's like this is just this is just the gang you know (laughs) here we are that's what's fascinating about this i i i I also just ask because you know like especially especially like lesbian and and gay culture has become so co-opted into like uh corporate the the corporate world now and it's interesting to kind of watch this movie which is so like otherworldly to like the corporate world um well i mean now you got you know rainbow banners on like target you know for pride month and stuff like that you know it's like 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 now like i think when when this like pink flamingos or something is coming out like that was still at least um widely through the country probably not in in places like baltimore or la or new york that was relatively widely like taboo and like there's something like i don't know what i'm trying to say but like you have (laughs) it's almost like you have this taboo subject at least in 1972 um and you have just the most repugnant characters doing the most repugnant stuff and i think it plays for the audience they want to play but at the same time if you're just like random person across the country catching this you're just like what the hell is up with i don't think a lot of people random people across the country were probably catching it when it first came out probably not Um, yeah it premiered in like a a 
oh, what was it? It wasn't like a a theater. It was like a cafeteria. Yeah, it premiered in like a cafeteria. <laughs> so it's like, I don't think, you know, a lot of people were watching this at the very beginning. Yeah. It's just, an, I, I hope that, um, I hope that, you know, younger people who are like trying to like find, uh, to like, you know, go and explore film, like include John Waters in that journey. Cause I think especially like from the ones I've seen, like this one and, and especially female trouble, which is pretty much like, let's have the star is born, but with divine and make it super sad. Um, like like he like i think john waters is definitely somebody like worth engaging with especially like when it comes to like exploring american movies and american counterculture movies i think also there's something i don't know like there there the moment that we're living in now in which like everyone has the capacity to document themselves and do things on camera um is is weirdly and interestingly parallel to like what John Waters was doing. Um, like, I mean, I don't think it's an accident that you know he appeared in a Jackass movie. I mean, that whole idea of let's set a camera down and do things that are like borderline self destructive, like all in the name of just being extreme and edgy. Um, and that that in and of itself has become kind of like a like an element of you know internet culture especially like you know all these you know youtube videos or tiktoks or whatever like there's the ones that are very like pristine and slick or just kind of like you know not that great but there is like an element of tiktok or youtube where when people document themselves there is this sort of like razor's edge quality of um you know chaos and unpredictability that the medium allows because people have access to it. Um, and like anyone has the ability to record themselves and there's that feeling in like the John Waters movies too, like where just this, this act of documenting things, like whatever it is, like in and of itself feels like liberatory and radical, uh, because of who gets put in front of the camera and who is a lot behind the camera and all that, like who's involved in the production. And like, there's an element of like the way that media has completely been blown up and opened up by um, like uh, digital photography and smartphone cameras and, and like, yeah, I mean, everybody, that. everybody has like a, has like a high, especially depending on what iPhone you have. Like if you have one of those newer ones, I mean, the cameras on those are as strong as, you know, getting a DSLR camera or something like right. that. Right. But even, yeah. And even, but even like, I mean, like, it's like a thing uh, with like, for instance, like when you mix your audio, like on a, like on a Vine or TikTok, like there will be some people who will intentionally clip the audio. Right. Um, just to like, you know, be funny or weird. Um, and like, I think that is in some way, like in the legacy of John Waters, where it's like, we're gonna, you know, we have the ability to make a, something that's like slicker and more conventional. And especially with a lot of, um, uh, like the kind of filters you can put on like a Snapchat video or something like that. You can make something look fairly like decent and, and slick, but this uh, this desire that people still have to just be transgressive on camera and like transgressive in like a stylistic sense or like just a bizarre, uh, you know, I'm going to film myself doing something kind of strange and off-putting sense. Like, I don't know. Like, I think that there's like a sort of uh, spiritual successor to John Waters and some of that. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's a good point. Any uh, anything else on Pink Flamingos before we wrap up? Did everybody say what repulsed them the most over the course of this movie? It was the chicken, the, the chicken scene. Ash, anything that just gets you? I'm trying to think. There's like, I don't know. I think the scene in the the house with the, it, but also the. Um, just like the eating scene is also like pretty gross. Just all the scenes are pretty gross in general. 
the the dog the dog shit scene really is pretty gross. As as you know, it's all pretty gross. The blowjob scene just got, like less that it's a blowjob and more that the character is technically her is divine son. Like that's where it becomes like you're like oh. Mm. And just the whole setup of like the women chained in the basement. <laughs> I, yeah, I, <laughs> like, I actually don't really like that part of the movie. And like, yeah, that that whole the, setup is yeah, just, and it gets really gross too. Like when he gets the syringe and stuff. But you know, whatever. <laughs> you do you, John Waters. Yeah, yeah it's. I mean, you know, I I was I I mentally prepared myself the whole day yesterday to go into it. I'm like, I know what I'm getting into, so you know. I, Ready to ride. You're rewatching it. Like the first time I watched it, um, I was like, "Wow, that was really something," and I enjoyed it. But I was like, "That was really intense." And this second time, like, on, like it was genuinely enjoyable. Like the movie was to me. Like the second time, like once I knew what the things were that were coming, and I didn't have to be afraid of each new shot. And this, what, what did each new shot offer? Like it was a genuinely like pleasant experience to watch this and. I mean, that's probably yeah, not going to be the case I, for everyone, but... Well, I think that that, like, initial thing... Like, you know, like, every scene is kind of like a jump scare. <laughs> you know, the first time you watch it, it's like, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, there's surprise in every scene. And so I think the more you watch it, the more you can, like, anticipate the, like, uncomfortable or, like, gross moments. It's like, all right you know yeah i'll have to, I'll have to watch it a, uh, a second time it is i think the criterion collection just put out a, a release of it so i'd be curious to see how they kind of read you know rework it and kind of and get it up to like the quality bump that they give it ash have you watched it with an audience like i, I i've watched it both times on my own and i think i want to see it with an audience um i've not seen it like with an audience i've seen it like by myself but also like with a few other people if you count that as an audience just like not like a full theater you know sort of thing which i feel like would be a a crazy crazy. experience yeah (laughs) i would love to do that central cinema if you're listening yeah yeah you're the only one in town that's gonna do it yeah no honestly i would i would definitely go and watch this again if it was like in a theater with a bunch of people just everybody yeah. reacting to it that I, sounds like like i can't i can't imagine the midnight screenings in la for 10 years or whatever of this like that sounds yeah incredible. i saw um like my first movie back in theater after covid for a while was i saw jackass forever when it came out and it was such a rewarding experience seeing it in the theater with a bunch of other people just reacting to all the stuff, you know, similar to, I feel like a John Waters experience in a way. I, I honestly, I went and saw Jackass Forever also in theaters, and it was a wonderful experience. Everybody's just like enjoying it. It's, I feel real community. It's great. Well, he's Jackass, he's in one John of the Waters. Jackass movies. I think it's the second one. Um, yeah. All right, well that'll wrap up this episode of Cinematary. Oh yeah, no, it's great. It's the second one. It's fantastic. Um, but that'll wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary on tw- and on Twitter and Instagram at, at cinematary. Um, go to letterbox.com slash cinematary if you want to keep up with the movies that we talk about in this episode. Um, if you'd like to support the show, uh, whether it's $1, $5, or whatever you would like to give, um, you can go to patreon.com slash cinematary. Thank you so much to our patrons, Cam, Chad Newsom, Corey Willingham, Candace Sisson, Ron Hayes, Teresa Marsathi, Titus Arthur, and Tyler Chandler. Thank you so much for your patronage. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, next week's film is the 1976 film In the Realm of the Senses, and I feel like our uh, crazy fucked up level will still say it's gonna stay on the same level. So we're just gonna we're gonna work that wavelength for a while. Less poop. It's just a lot of a lot of different types of sex. With some Eggman's coming back. Who doesn't want eggs delivered straight to their house in like a nice little fancy box? 
I would let the Eggman in. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for listening, and we will see you next time.